Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I want to talk about Kalor. Now, for the purposes of this video, there may be spoilers for Memories of Ice, uh, Told the Hounds, Return of the Crimson Guard and uh, Blood and Bone. Th those are the ones that I'll be referring to. So uh, the easiest way to do this is just spoilers for all Malazan works. Um, personally, I don't think it actually spoils anything about this, but you know, to each their own. So consider this a spoiler warning for the whole of the novels of the Malazan Empire and the Malazan Book of the Fallen, even though it's not taking things from uh, Dust of Dreams of the Crippled God and it's not taking things from a seal. That being said, Kalor. I, I quite like hashtag Kalor did nothing wrong, but that is flippant and facetious. Um, what I really like about Kalor's story is it is the tragic downfall. I view Kalor as a tragic figure, not as a villain, um, or not quite that simply put. And one of the reasons for this is while Kalor is presented to us sequentially as we encounter him in the various narratives, Kalor is presented as a bad person, as a mean person, as potentially an evil person. But when we take the context of his entire story into account, some of which may or may not be changed by um, Walk in Shadow, the third Carcanus book, which is forthcoming. But when we take into account what happened to him, I think it changes him from an outright villain into a tragic figure. So I'm going to talk through a couple of these aspects. And one of the difficulties we have with trying to interpret Kalor or trying to understand Kalor is that we don't get a lot of definitive information about him. A lot of what we find out about Kalor is from other people's perspectives. And even then, in Told the Hounds, when we get Kalor's perspectives of things. This is so late on in his life that he comes across as quite brutal and cold and pragmatic and callous, but it's almost jarring considering the mental image that we have formed of his character. So starting with Memories of Ice, in the prologue of Memories of Ice, we have this scene described in which Kalor is sitting on a throne of bones. He's sitting on the charred remains of his empire. And he is confronted by three elder gods who have arrived to wrap him on the wrist. Now, that sequence is told from the perspective of one of the elder gods. That's the perspective of this. Therefore, this elder god is arriving to chastise Kalor. Now, if that is your position, you genuinely and generally don't give the benefit of the doubt to the person sitting there. You've arrived to enact a punishment on someone. And the entire framing of this, although it is with this perspective, is that it is not necessarily the literal truth of what happened. The way that part of the prologue is narrated. The style of the narration, what is being suggested, is far less literal than I think a lot of us approach it and far more mythic or fable-like or creation myth. That it is allegorically true, that there is truth to what went on, that there is some sort of conflict that happened between Kalor and these gods, but what is on the page is not necessarily definitively what happened and the way that it happened. When we think of uh, Greek myths and the golden apple story, the apple of discord, with the K for Callisti written on it, for the, the most beautiful, do we think that literally happened that way or is it an allegory for something that led to this conflict? 
there are different ways of interpreting it. And it's not that anyone has to be the right way. But for me personally, I find reading it as not the literal truth, but an allegorical truth much more interesting. Because when we start breaking down the facts of that particular sequence, we can see that it doesn't quite add up in the way that these elder gods are seeming to present it. So the first thing is, Kalor is sitting on a devastated realm. We know from the prologue, from the um, earlier scenes in the prologue, that the thaumaturgs of Jakaruku called down the crippled god essentially to strike Kalor. And that's what happens in the Memories of Ice prologue and is confirmed in Blood and Bone. That's what happened. The thaumaturgs tried to destroy Kalor by summoning an alien god to give them power. This led to mass devastation. And the pieces of the crippled god rained down like comets, destroying everything with fire and impact. And when we see Kalor sitting on his kingdom, his kingdom is scarred by fire and destruction. The fire and destruction that one would associate with being struck by multiple magical comets. Now, the counter to this is Kalor says that he did this to his kingdom. He claims ownership. And this is a couple of years after the calling down of the crippled god. And I would suggest that A, Kalor does have an element of arrogance and hubris. He was the high king. He did rule an entire continent. And that requires a certain level of hubris, at least for Kalor. And this happened to his realm. So he is owning it. He is saying, yes, this is my fault. I did this. I am responsible for this. And who is he saying this to? He's saying it to three elder gods who have rocked up to chastise him. And from his perspective, and this is a what if, imagine you are the ruler of a massive kingdom and one small element from a neighboring continent that may or may not be part of your kingdom. We don't know the delineation of the, the first kingdom, but they have called down massive devastation and killed everyone, everyone you knew, everyone you ruled over. They have destroyed towns and cities and lands. Even the survivors after that initial impact, fires have started up and have been rolling across the land, burning everything. Fires that have been burning for months before guttering out. Fires that may have lasted for a year or two before guttering out that this is not instantaneous devastation, this is ongoing. And you're sitting there watching your entire kingdom be destroyed. And in that time, none of these fabled gods who reside in this world, who you know exist, who you have interacted with, who are known to interact with their followers, none of them have stepped in to save a single person that you knew or you loved, or that you cared about. Now, ask yourself, if they then rock up to have a go at you about how you've mismanaged things, are you going to go, you know what, you're right. Should have done things a bit better. Or are you going to be angry? And if you are angry, you can confront them directly, or you can do something slightly different. You can undercut them. You can curse them back. You can do all of these different things. And all of that is within the spectrum of a human reaction. And Kalor looking around after having been beaten by this magical cavalcade from the stars that has devastated his entire land is looking around and these three gods come up and he's like, where the hell were you guys? You know what? Yeah, this is my fault. I did this. I'm responsible for this. None of you are. I'm the human here. You're these divine powers. Leave. Go away. This has nothing to do with you. You had every opportunity to step in years ago and you didn't. You had every opportunity to stop this devastation and you didn't. This is a human problem. I'm owning it. I'm taking control of it. Leave. And if that is his attitude, that's 
understandable. It's maybe not necessarily the attitude that we personally would have in this situation. It's very hard to imagine ourselves in that person in that situation. But that anger at the gods for not stepping in, the depression and devastation and anger at what had happened to the realm that you created and cared for, that is understandable. And not wanting to cooperate with them or be helpful to these elder gods when they show up after the fact, after millions have died. We can understand that. And why I think that Kalor is more of a benevolent figure than perhaps we're led to believe is from blood and bone, in that we see that, yes, the modern day Kalor is cruel and pernicious, but we get little hints in blood and bone that the High King actually was quite benevolent. And the people who didn't think he was benevolent were the Thaumaturgs. Now let's look at that source of information, the Thaumaturgs, the ones carrying out inhumane, cruel experiments, the ones that are terrorizing everyone around them, the ones that are fanatical, that their point of view and their way of viewing the universe is the only way. And anyone who disagrees with that is wrong and evil and tainted. Now that is the perspective that is telling us that Kalor was bad. And when you're on the side of the Thaumaturgs, you have to question whether or not you're on the wrong side. And if they are evil, that leaves the potential that Kalor actually was quite a benevolent ruler and their reaction against him was because he was trying to stamp out their pernicious, evil, fascistic, inhumane, cruel cult. Are they likely to describe him as benevolent? No. But would we describe Kalor in that sense as benevolent? More than likely, yes, the thaumaturgs are evil. What they are doing is evil. What they are doing is cruel. And so Kalor, in acting against them, with the fragmentary information that we have, could actually be quite a benevolent figure who then suffers this terrible tragedy. And he is then blamed and cursed by the gods because he didn't do anything to stop this. And the gods, again, have their own agenda. The crippled god was called down. This has led to a disruption of their power, dis disruption of the Warrens. It has led to Ascendant gaining new power. It has thrown their world into chaos. And who's responsible? Well, they can't really blame the Thaumaturgs. Most of them have been wiped out. And also there's a bunch of them and there's not one person, whereas they were all fighting against Kalor. Let's all blame Kalor. We don't like Kalor. Kalor has a lot of power. He's on the verge of ascendancy. He's on the verge of gaining godhood and becoming a rival, well, we can slap him down. That seems far more in keeping with the elder gods and far more in keeping with their machinations and why they have been chaining aspects of the crippled god this entire time in the, the history leading up to the Malazan Book of the Fallen. That seems reasonable to assume. And therefore, because the story is being framed from their perspective, looking at Kalor. That's why we get this very negative connotation because they are not admitting to themselves that they were in the wrong. They're not admitting their own guilt. And that leads us on to, well, why do we always perceive Kalor as a villain? And if we think back when we heard in Garden to the Moon about Kalor, Kalor was described as being allied with the Crimson Guard and Anamander Rake and Kaladin Brood. Rake is the only one really who we get to see that yes, there's a brief mention of the Crimson Guard, they very briefly appear. But from that perspective, Rake's the only one we see, the only one we start to get an idea that maybe he's not evil. But the others are pretty much described as enemies of the Malazans, the point of view that we hold, the point of view that we come to respect, the point of view we empathize with. And because we're on the side of the Malazans and Kalor is on the other side, we immediately other him we immediately think of Kalor as the enemy, as being evil. And we're going to misread a lot of what he says because we have that bias in place before we meet him in Memories of Ice. And then in Memories of Ice, Kalor wants to kill Silver Fox. How dare he? That, that contains part of Tattersail's soul. And 
we loved Hattersale and we wanted to survive. And she's just a young girl. But what does Calor say? That she is an abomination. She has untold power in the body of a child that hasn't fully formed yet. Her mind hasn't fully formed yet. No one can control her. Do you want this potential nuclear weapon walking around, not knowing when it's going to go off and how it's going to devastate all those around them? Calor takes a very pragmatic view of it and says, Silver Fox is dangerous. We already have enough dangers. We can end this danger by the killing of one life. It's cold. It's cruel. It's pragmatic. It's not necessarily evil. And added to this, Calor knows that Nightchill's soul is in there as well. The God that cursed him. And yeah, that is a perfectly natural form of vengeance and revenge that ordinarily we would go, yeah, we can understand that. But because Tattersail is in there and because we liked Tattersail, because we had the perspective of Tattersail, because Whiskey Jack wants to protect this young girl, even though she's not really a young girl, that because of the narrative perspective, we side very heavily with Whiskey Jack and we see Calor as being evil when he's actually being quite pragmatic. Now, does that mean what he is doing here is good? No, I'm not saying that. But this is after a lifetime, a hundred lifetimes, a thousand lifetimes of seeing the rise and fall of ascendance, of always trying to gain power and always seeing it crumble away. He has been broken over time. He has been destroyed over time by all of these things, that he has become bitter, he has become cynical, he has lost hope. And when he sees the opportunity to enact revenge on the person that cursed him, of course that is going to be overwhelming. He wants to destroy Nightchill. It, it takes a bigger man than I am to sidestep from that and go, you know what, I'll get over this person that cursed me thousands of years ago to this life of misery because well you know she does have all of this magical power that could destroy us all and i'll step aside from that as well because she's in the body of a young girl from calor's perspective all humans are not young from calor's perspective one human is basically the same as another because they all grow up and die he's seen all of his wives all of his partners all of the people he has loved over all of this time. He has met them, he's fallen in love with them, and then inevitably watched them die. And that is a tragedy. That is a tragic figure, not a villain. And added into this, when he goes to attack Silver Fox, when he's finally not being watched, and he goes to attack Silver Fox, Whiskey Jack steps in to defend her. He doesn't attack Whiskey Jack. He didn't attack Whiskey Jack. Whiskey Jack stepped in to defend Silver Fox, which again, very noble deed. We like Whiskey Jack. And Calor basically begs him to step away. I don't want to fight you. I don't want to kill you. But if you get in my way, I will, because this needs to be done. He thinks he is making the tough decision so that other people don't have to. Hmm, where have we heard this before? When Anamander Rick stepped in to say, I will kill the Teneskari so that Whiskey Jack doesn't have to. I will do the difficult thing so you don't have to. And Whiskey Jack misread that. Whiskey Jack looked at it as Anamander being cruel. And we all know that Erickson likes putting in these parallels. Here we have the same thing again. Another ascendant style figure, another figure with all of this power, all of this age, all of this wind wisdom, stepping in to do the difficult thing, the uncomfortable thing, the evil thing, so that someone else doesn't have to suffer that stain on their soul. And Whiskey Jack, once again, 
refuses. It is a repetition of what happened before. And he steps in in front of Calwar. But unlike Anamander Rick, Calor has slightly less control over his impulses and fights Whiskey Jack and kills him. But even in the death of Whiskey Jack, Calor was fighting him and he may have disarmed him, but Whiskey Jack's leg broke suddenly, causing him to lurch in the wrong position, which meant that Calor's strike impaled him. Did Calor intend to impale him? We don't know because we're not getting Calor's perspective. We're getting Whiskey Jack's. Whiskey Jack is seeing him as an opponent. Whiskey Jack is seeing Calor trying to kill him. But Whiskey Jack's leg breaks, and that's the thing that leads to him being impaled and killed when he would have ordinarily knocked it away. He would have blocked it. He, he would have... Oh, I forget the fencing terms. Repost, whatever. <clears throat> and then think in Told the Hounds when Kalor faces off against Spinach Dorau. Again, another figure. He does not want to fight. He asks, don't fight me. Walk away. I don't want to fight you. I don't want to kill you. Why are you standing in my way? And the fight starts. And they fight to a standstill. And Kalor does not kill him. Kalor doesn't kill him after he has defeated him. He respects him. Now think back to that scene in Memories of Ice when he was fighting Whiskey Jack. Would the same thing have happened there? Or is it potentially that this is a change, that after this happened to Whiskey Jack, now Kalor has changed? We, we don't know. Again, because so much of Kalor's perspective is shrouded in mystery that we have to extrapolate from potential information within the text. But here we have an incident that's very, very similar, and yet in it, Kalor shows mercy. He's not evil. He's not stabbing Spinot now that he has won the battle, now that he's won the duel. He's not killing him, not in the same way that a lot of the other duelists that we have seen depicted in the series have, where they have disarmed someone and then run them through. Even though they have won the duel, they carry on to kill their opponent, something that we see in Told the Hounds in stark contrast to how Kalor behaves. Kalor behaves like an honorable opponent, whereas the human does not. And again, Erickson likes showing us these things from multiple perspectives. So what this comes down to, I think, is that Kalor is a truly tragic figure, and he doesn't always do the right things. I'm not saying he's a hero. I'm not saying he is good. But I think he is a figure steeped in tragedy, that the initial benevolent ruler or person that Kalor was, who was acting for the good of his people, the devastation wrought by the Thaumaturgs sends him partly mad that everything has been destroyed. And then the gods, to add insult to injury, have the temerity to blame him, to come down as if this is his fault. And you know what? If they're going to say that to him, fine, accept the fault. I'll accept the fault because this is actually on you guys, but you don't have the honor to accept it. I will. And then after that point, for thousands of years to come, he is destined to keep living and using the century candles to try to keep young because they didn't curse him with eternal, um, eternal youth. He keeps aging. And he needs to find a way out of the curse. He needs to find a way to get back at these gods that have ruined his life. Every person he loves, and anytime he finds love, it turns to dust. Because for someone who has lived for thousands of years, the human lifespan is so short. And he has become cynical. He has become bitter. He has become world weary. And yet, in that moment, even after all of this, he doesn't act out of malice. He doesn't act 
out of, hmm, I'm just going to be cruel and kill people. He joined forces with Caledon Brood and Anamander Rake to forestall the rise of the Malazan Empire because it gave him something to do. And it was a good cause, stopping an expansionist empire. And he knows empires rise and fall. That's the way of things. But they're still worth in trying. When he sees Silver Fox, he sees the danger that she represents. And lo and behold, what happens to the Talana Mass army? Oh, disappears. If people had paid attention to Kalor, maybe it wouldn't have. However, that's a different thing. And each time we see, he does make harsh decisions. He does make cruel decisions. But this is after a lifetime of loss and pain and suffering. And where we can extend empathy and understanding to certain characters like Felison, we don't seem to be able to extend the same understanding and sympathy and empathy and compassion to Kalor, even though when we view his actions from his perspective and from the perspective of something slightly more objective than the close third person narration that we get, we see that Kalor is not quite as evil as we think. So while it is never quite as clean cut as hashtag Kalor did nothing wrong, as snappy as that is, I think there's a lot of nuance to Kalor as a character that we frequently overlook because we like Whiskey Jack. We like Tattersail, we like Silver Fox, we even like Spinock Giraffe. And when Traveler runs him through, we kind of celebrate felt good when he did that. And the big thing that sells all of this is Kalor sided with the crippled god. And at the time, we viewed that very much as the enemy. But look how the Malazan Book of the Fallen ends. The crippled god was never the enemy. So that's why I think Kalor is a tragic figure. I think he is misunderstood. And while he may have done one or two things wrong, I don't think he's the villain that people make out. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for your continued support. And I'll see you in the next one.